Hello. Welcome, Hi. everyone. Hello. So I'll start Hi. off with an introduction. Uh, my name is Sarah, and I am the Education Assistant at Dunlop Art Gallery, part of Regina Public Library. Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome you to Quick and Dirty Artist Talks number 24, Botanical. So tonight we've invited uh, four artists who work with botanical themes to discuss their inspirations and practices with us. Before we get started though, I would like to acknowledge that Regina Public Library and Dunlop Art Gallery are on the lands um, of Treaty 4 territory. So that is the traditional territory of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and uh, the homeland of the Métis. I would also like to um, take a moment to acknowledge the support of Dunlop Art Gallery's key funders, which are the Canada Council for the Arts, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, and Saskatchewan Lotteries. I also want to give um, an invitation to our viewers. Um, so welcome everyone, and also an invitation to um, you to share questions throughout tonight's program. Um, so for at the end of each uh, presenter, we will take a couple minutes for a Q&A. So do ask questions in the comments section. So up first, we have Laura Sermon. So Laura Sermon's work explores the intersection of art, science and history through uh, investigating patches of wildness that survive within the suburban and urban landscapes. Her explorations continue into the forests of British Columbia, where she aims to teach herself how to see the diversity of the forest floor in the midst of an era where this knowledge has lost its priority, but not its importance. With an ongoing practice of collecting wild plant specimens, Laura is creating digital uh, herbarium documenting the life cycle of plants while learning about different aspects and uses the flora of gro uh, growing in Canada's most biodiverse province. Through learning about the role of plants in the ecosystem and the gifts they offer us, one becomes more conscious of the mutual connections of life and the importance of reciproc <laughs> reciprocity between humans and the earth. So welcome, Laura. And a reminder to our viewers too, please add any questions that you have for uh, Lara uh, during the chat uh, in the presentation. So I am going Thanks. to say goodbye for a moment to Melanie, Bernie, and Wendy. All right, so right. are you ready? I'm We're going to share yes, our screen. So. All right, is it going to start cycling? Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Lara Sermon and I'm from British Columbia, which as you can see from this map is the most biodiverse province in all of Canada. Um, when I was a teenager, I heard in a documentary that children are able to identify more logos than they could identify the trees around them. So one day I decided to correct that problem and I wanted to learn um, about all the different plants. So I bought that field guide to teach myself um, the names of different plants. And in the process of educating myself about plants, I would often take small, small specimens home and then scan them on a scanner. So I had a record of what I found. And I would notice that these plants would transform throughout the year, um, throughout the season. Um, and I unintentionally continued this very old tradition of creating botanical images, but one that was photographic rather than illustrative. Um, all of these botanical images I'm creating are part of what I hope is a lifelong series that I call Codex Specificus, and it's been hugely important um, as a starting point for my art practice. Um, it's been my method of teaching myself about the world, the natural world around me. And so not only do I create botanical images, but I like to forage for them too. Uh, one thing I've discovered about myself is I take great joy in participating in these ancient practices, um, those that cross-cultural boundaries like learning about plants, of course, foraging for food and weaving. I actually made that small basket in that um, previous slide. Um, I'm very drawn to patterns and repetition. So in this series, I use invasive plants arranged in a design based on the golden ratio. Um, this is oxide daisy and the design is informed by the plant itself. So if you look at the central yellow disc of the daisy, it matches the overall shape that I've created here. So this is an extreme detail of the previous slide. The photographs are both very high res, um, so I can print them quite large, but the depth of field is very shallow um, because of the scanner that I use. Um, and often when I'm creating these scans, 
I capture bugs in my work, like this little inchworm, and I don't often notice until after I've captured the scans and I'm looking through the images on my computer. This is an example of my setup for this type of image. Um, so I create the design in real life, and then I capture between 20 and 40 scans with my little regular scanner. Uh, and I spend a lot of time in Photoshop seamlessly stitching them together to create something that um, can print at about six feet tall, so larger than life. Um, recently, I've been getting into making public art. This is a vinyl mural wrap I um, created for a utility box in Vancouver, and I'm using the invasive plant tufted vetch, which uh, here it's printed much larger than it is in real life. I think there's this perception that I'm always in the forest looking for these plants, but I'm often in very urban settings. So here I am on the side of a highway, I'm foraging the previous plant tufted vetch. Uh, and what I find really unfortunate is there's these beautiful wild places that are full of, of different bees and bugs. And unfortunately, not long after I foraged these plants, um, this area was just mown down. I think we should have more wild spaces um, on unused lawns um, rather than letting them be a flat green manicured space. Here's another art piece that I created for a vinyl mural wrap um, using plants that are found in this region, uh, a type of canary grass and Canada goldenrod. And um, that was the first public art piece I made, but it wasn't installed till about two years after I created it. Uh, I've been making an effort to work in other mediums other than photography, and I didn't fabricate this, but this is my own design, and it's my first public art piece in the 3D realm. It represents the evergreen trees that grow in this region, the mountain views, the Fraser Highway, and the Fraser River that um, run both through and um, beside uh, the, the city that it's installed in. Here's my most recent public art piece that I call the forest floor. It's at the entrance of a cultural center. And if you look at the inner perimeter, you can see there is um, a tree stump. Um, so that when you're standing in the center of this piece, you essentially become the new growth that is sprouting from this once mighty tree, um, as we often see young saplings that grow from the center of tree stumps. And here are two of the panels um, from that art piece. And over on the right, you'll see that white flower, which is a trillium, um, and some jelly cups, the, the fungi there, the orange one. Um, and somebody had said that it looks like these two are in an intimate conversation with each other, which I think is a really beautiful interpretation. This is my very basic setup in the forest. Um, the scanner is underneath that black velvet. I have to block the light from entering it because I'll get this really ghostly effect if I don't, which looks cool, but it's not what I want. Um, and I'm limited by my the battery life in my scanner, so I would have to go out over a period of a few weeks to scan. This is a project I finished about a year ago for an art and science festival, and I collaborated with the geneticist, and we sequenced the DNA of two invasive plants, um, which are pictured in the background. Um, and then I took a small sequence of that DNA and I converted it to music. And I really wish I could show you the song, but I can only show you images. So if you visit this website, this URL down at the bottom, you can hear the song. Um, it's, uh, I, I made this entire music box. It took me, it's a year long project. I even made the glockenspiel. I made the big drum in the back. Um, it consumed quite a lot of my life. And I, um, I got a bit of media attention for it. I was actually on French CBC on TV and on Global News National, which was really interesting. Um, started getting a bunch of phone calls across Canada, like, is that Lara on TV? Uh, yeah, so it's on, which is also my website if you're curious to see um, that interview. And this is the score for the song, for Flora's song, and the two plants. Um, as I was saying earlier, I'm very drawn to patterns and repetition. So in the earlier months of this pandemic, I started to draw, which I don't typically do. Um, and I started using plants that I, I have learned, I've discovered, I've um, encountered in my explorations of the forest. So the previous one was a fern, spiny wood fern. And here, this is a shrub that grows in the ground. It's called kinnikinnik or bearberry. It's an edible berry, though they're not very tasty. Um, I'm very much inspired by Islamic design, and I, I do try to use a lot of the same principles, um, such as like using um, repeating pentagons or, or squares. And lately I've been spending a lot of time looking through these old digitized books that are in the public domain and started collaging them together. So this is a work in progress um, by, it's a book of ferns by the famous botanist um, and illustrator William Jackson Hooker. And looking through these old books, I've discovered, I've realized that our curiosity and um, imagining the natural world, uh, re re um, connecting I mean with the natural world, um, which is what I do for my series Codex Pacificus, it's very, 
Well, it, it's it's part of my effort to experience that connection to the natural world, which is one that um, well, William Hooker, the botanist, has had done um, well nearly two hundred years ago when he created these illustrations. Thank you. That went really quick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting me be longer for that last slide. That's okay. We'll let it slide. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lara. Um, so uh, if any viewers have questions, now we're going to do a little question um, and answer period. Um, but Wendy had a question, so I'm going to join her on here. And Wendy, did you want to ask your question? Oh, Ghost plants when you're walking in the BC forest. I haven't. I would like to. Um, I actually I did a residency last year in Ottawa and I learned about the ghost plant, but we never saw it. So uh, yes, I've yet to find yeah, it. They're amazing. Like I, how often do I go to BC? Very rarely. Um, but my, on my last visit, I came across ghost plants. Um, and when I lived in BC for two years, I've seen them one other time. Okay. Um, so I'm just saying, keep trying. They're yeah. really, really, really amazing. Do you find that it, it tends to grow like underneath a certain tree or like around mm -hmm. certain plants? No, it wasn't. I, I'm not as keen perhaps as you would be in looking because I just saw them and I went, ah, you know, and I was with my sister who lives in Powell River, BC, and she didn't know anything about them. And I, I said, I can't believe I've seen these twice now. And I rarely, like, I'm not a BC person. Um, but, and I, so I didn't know where, other than I've heard that they, they pop up like a mushroom, right? They just sort of, yeah. you have to have all the right conditions and they come after a period of rain. Um, so and, and there's all these Here. chemicals in the ground that okay. kind of cause them to do yeah. their thing. And then they die like a day later oh, yeah. or something. They're very short lived, but just keep looking. Maybe okay. you'll have to send me a note when you see one. For sure. I'll take pictures. Yeah, for those totally you, take pictures. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you who don't know what a ghost plant is, it's a parasitic plant um, and it doesn't photosynthesize. So it's white. And apparently when you touch it, it, it bruises black. So it, um, it steals nutrients from whatever plants are growing around it. That's so interesting. Thanks Thank for that you. question, Wendy. So Lara, we also have a question here sure. from Margaret and I'm gonna show this on the screen here. Okay. So is the color hooker's green named after the botanist that you're studying? I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. Yeah, because there's a lot of plants that are actually named after him. So I, yeah, I discovered that recently. I'm like, oh, I have a little tube of green that's called hooker's green. Why is it called that? Yeah, it's the botanist. Amazing. And we've got another one here too. From Gerald, could oh, you refer sure. a link in, uh, for your website that has the music box? Could you scroll back to that um, slide? I sure can. Yeah, the project was called Flora's Song. It's a fairly random sounding song, but if you listen to it a few times, you start to hear um, a melody um, appearing. Right. So it's www.larasermon.com uh, yeah, slash Flora's dash song. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions from our viewers? Okay. I Thank think we are going you. to move on. Thank you very much, Lara. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs> All right, up next, Melanie Monique Rose. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. So yeah, thanks for joining us. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna do your bio here. Uh, Melanie Monique Rose is a visual artist from Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, Treaty 4 territory, and a longtime contributing member of Sigeowak uh, Artist Collective Incorporated. She attended Katune School of the Arts with a major in fiber arts in Nelson, BC. Rose has exhibited her work in both group, uh, group and solo exhibitions uh, nationally. Her greatest honor was to receive the Distinction of Excellence in Textiles in Dimension's 2013 touring show. In addition to showing her work, Rose has worked in the province as a gallery facilitator, storykeeper, and art instructor for the Mackenzie Art Gallery, and in addition teaches various workshops um, at bo both public and private institutions. In 2018, her daughter Meadow Rose was born and is currently a full-time mom, ca caregiver, and artist. 
Becoming a mother has increased Rose's desire uh, to share stories of her culture and family and has challenged the ways um, in which she creates independently and as a shared experience with her daughter. Rose has inspired and excited uh, to see where the journey takes her as an artist. So welcome, Melanie. Thank and you. another reminder to our viewers that are joining us now, um, please ask any questions for Melanie um, in the chat there. All right, so I'm going to leave and I'm going to leave it to you. Hi there, everyone. Hi, so this piece is called Summer Sleeping. I look at this piece as a land acknowledgement. It's a circle and it's speaking to the relationship that I have with the land and also um, the relationship that my Métis ancestors have with this place. Um, it's about my grandmother, Olive Rose, right there. Um, my family is super, super important to me. She's the matriarch of our family. and. You'll see through the rest of the talk, I speak about how the influences of my family and how that's super, super important to me. Before my grandma died, I got a present from her and it was a blanket and it was a story about our family. This is uh, the first blanket that I made. Um, it was for my sister, um, his mother, um, Khalida Jarar, who's a prominent um, political um, and social figure in Palestine and she was arrested in the middle of the night um, by Israeli soldiers so I wanted to give her something um, to make her feel warm and that's kind of how I got into working in blankets this is a blanket piece as well so the idea of a blanket um, you know it's that cozy warmth um, security um, and I, I found it as a really great vehicle um, to tell my story. Here's my um, latest piece that I've done. It's called We Are the Flower People. So the series that I work on, I've been doing it for several years now, and it, it is called The Flower People. And it comes from a name given to the Métis, who are known as the Flower Beadwork People. And I've kind of reinterpreted that in my own way. Uh, so some of my earliest influences, I thought this was kind of funny. It's like the Flower People in... Um, Alice in Wonderland. Um, so there's, I've decided to show you a lot of different influences that I have. Um, so this one for sure with the flower as people and telling stories. Uh, this is me as a Ukrainian dancer. So I am both a Ukrainian and Métis and a lot of my um, work is inspired by my heritage. Um, the Ukrainian floral um, regalia for dancing. You can see the flower crown that I'm wearing there. Um, here you see the babushka and the pezenke. So I, I grew up really immersed in my um, Ukrainian culture on my mother's side. So that's really, um, really immersed in that and has really influenced the marks that I make and the ways that I choose to tell stories. Um, these pezenke, they all also tell stories. They have symbolism in them. Um, right here you see Louis Riel's coat. There's also a Christy Belcourt piece and a Catherine Boyer. Um, I'm Métis on my father's side and that's definitely influenced the way that I um, approach um, making. And I really see those two cultures really come together. Another influence is the flower power movement of um, the late 60s. Um, both the graphics and then also just that um, that activism and that peace style resistance that kind of back to nature movement. So that's definitely been um, I had a both a linear and queer education and when I was in school I in, at the CUNY school I met Wayne King here and this is some of his artwork and we spent many hours um, talking about art and life and uh, his attitude, beauty for beauty's sake, um, really left a mark on me. Um, while I was at school, at Kuni School of the Arts, I learned about the arts um, and crafts movement, um, which was really thinking about um, craftsmanship. This is um, a piece by William Morris. So lots of the flowy, um, the flowy lines and uh, the arts and craft movement was um, a direct response to the Industrial Revolution. Moving on here, <laughs> Western wear. Um, definitely music in my family on um, both sides and I've just always been drawn to 
um, country music and that culture and um, the outfits that um, people wear in there. You see, here's a piece of mine. It's called Coalesce. So it's kind of perfect showing all these things mixed together. Um, so this piece is a Hudson Bay coat, which I um, redid, um, reworked. I'm a, this is wool and I'm a needle felter. You'll see in the next slide, I also added the antler buttons there and the fur and that antler comes from a deer that my father um, killed for us for food. So I really like to incorporate those pieces as much as I can in my work. Uh, this piece here is another example of um, my Flower People series. So it's really important to me with a lot of my work I find vintage blankets um, and I, I like to repurpose and think about my footprint. Um, so this was something again that I reworked. Um, this is my girlfriend, she was the model as well. This is some of my new work that I'm doing is exploring um, natural color. We just happen to be in a ditch and we're super happy because she's looking for medicine and, and I'm looking for color. So that's sort of been my new direction in my work. I'd like to incorporate these natural colors into my felted works as well as um, paint making. And this is goldenrod here that I foraged this summer with brandy in the ditches. And I, I, if you're familiar as well, I thought it was kind of interesting. The Métis have also been known as the road allowance people. And so that was, it's really interesting being in the ditch there. <laughs> and getting back onto the land, this is me. Um, just enjoying being a color witch in the forest, seeking out those colors and just in, infusing that joy and play into my work and being inspired by the, the land around me in the forest. <laughs> okay, next, uh, there's my sweet daughter, Meadow. Um, yeah, incorporating her into my practice as well. She now always is asking me, mom, can we go pick berries? she helped me with the golden rod and she, she helps me as much as I can. So I'm, I'm trying to find that balance right now. And it's, it's both hard and amazing. And yeah, I'm very, really thankful for her and, and uh, what she contributes to me and the, the story of the flower people. Thanks. Thanks so much, Melanie. That was beautiful. Um, Wendy has a question here for you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to add her in. There we go. All right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm just wondering that some of the flowers that you depict, um, like some of them seem like they're based on on actual plant life, but or are they kind of like a, a fusion of some creative uh, approaches to your flowers and your designs? Or can you tell us the source for some of your depictions? Yeah, so I'm not really interested in making something look exactly the way that I would find a flower like it's more just inspired by so all those certain images that I I was sharing about um, for example Louis Riel's coat and the beadwork on there and just the influences I've had through um, regalia and my Ukrainian dancing outfits so all of that kind of has come together and me just trying to find my own my own particular way of coalescing those images, those flowers and putting them together. And I, I just really like the, um, the graphicness about them. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's what we have for questions. So thank you very much, Melanie. Um, and up next actually is Wendy. All right, welcome Wendy. Um, so I'm gonna share Wendy's bio. Um, so Wendy actually uh, is Dunlop Art Gallery's very own. Um, she's an artist, curator, educator, beekeeper, and gardener. She received her BFA and BA from the University of Regina and an MFA from the University of Victoria. She has exhibited uh, in various solo and group exhibitions in Canada, and her work is also in several private and public collections, including the University of Regina, Mackenzie Art Gallery, and Sask Arts. Um, she currently works at Dunlop Art Gallery as curator of education and 
community outreach. So welcome, Wendy. And a quick reminder again to our viewers that as Wendy is giving her presentation, you're welcome to ask questions for the Q&A afterwards. All right, I'm going to hand things over to you. Thanks, Sarah. And um, wow, I'm really inspired by the work um, of the artists who just um, showed us their amazing stuff. Um, so I'm going to try to do my best. I'm kind of using a little bit of my art practice with some of the interests that I'm currently quite involved with, which is my garden and my beekeeping practice. So I wanted to start off with um, some work I did with composters. Um, as I got deeper into my gardening world, I became quite interested in the composter as a living organism, as a thing that I had a relationship with. So these are some of the earlier composters. Um, one is called my pet composter. Oh, and then, oh, so here we go. <laughs> these are fast. Uh, I made a large uh, a public art commission. This is called the rolling composter. Um, and here's a picture of it on the grounds of Saskatoon City Hall. Um, and yeah, so it actually is a working composter. It currently resides on the campus of the U of R. Um, it has, it's full, you know, it actually works as a composter. Um, it's adorned with certain sayings about my relationship um, with composting, which yes, generally uh, a composting cycle takes about a year for me, but I have a whole system at home now where I've got like a couple of composters. I used to have six composters, but now I only have two. Um, I've become quite involved with my, with my yard in Regina on Treaty 4 territory. This is an image of when I was a part of Secret Gardens tour, which is New Dance Horizons fundraiser. Um, and here's a lovely artist or dancer dancing in my garden space with my garden in the background. Um, thank you, Bernie High, for taking this photograph for me. Uh, it is um, a, a, a photograph. I can see one of my beehives in the background there. Bernie actually helped me catch a swarm this year. Um, so this is a photo that he took, only a portion of this panorama. But you can see I have raised beds um, that I like to grow food for eating in. Uh, there's Bernie and myself. We are doing something. I can't remember what. Bernie can explain. <laughs> We were doing something um, to get, oh yeah, we were taking out frames to put into the new hive that I want to catch the swarm and put it in so that they would stay some honey and stuff for them and some brood. Uh, my bees love to go to my pond to drink water. There's an image of my pond there. They love to float on the floating things. And on the right, you can see um, the beginnings of a swarm that didn't actually end up happening. It was really, you can see that the bees are flying around, but they decided, oh my gosh, our queen is still too heavy to fly, so they went back in. As a beekeeper, I've become very aware of the fact that uh, there are native bees in my yard that I really need to nourish and take care of. So I was inspired by Lori Wiedenhammer, who's seen on the left here, who has uh, created this book called Victory Garden for Bees, which I bought. Um, and Lori did a project here in Regina at the Dunlop. So I really got into, I grew a bunch of new plants down in my basement um, greenhouse to get going for the spring. And of the, the highlights this year, I have to say, I'm just going to highlight some of them. The borage was amazing. It The bees, all the bees, not just my honeybees, but all the native bees just love the borage. And the anise hyssop, this was probably the, the second most favorite loved thing by the bees. There was always bees at the hyssop. Um, and Yes, so that's, I need to be able to support all the bee life in my yards. So that's why <clears throat> I've done this. Um, the dragon head, dragon head plant was another hot commodity for my bees. They actually, they love it. Um, I took this image off the internet because I failed to get good pictures, but I can see there's an ant inside one, one of those um, delicate flowers. So obviously more than just bees love um, to come and drink the nectar. People often ask me, what's my favorite plant? And I immediately will say a poppy. Um, but I, of my poppy, of poppies, my favorite is this purple one um, that grows in my garden kind of on its own. It's a volunteer. And I cherish every purple poppy that comes up. They don't last very long. Of course, the bees love the poppies. Um, my my favorite thing that happened, the favorite bee, the most exciting bee that came to my garden this year on the uh, Rudbeckia was this green sweat bee. Um, I'm not, sh uh, she's amazing. She's lovely. You can see she's very iridescent. She's an iridescent green. Uh, another cool thing 
I saw in my garden this year, because I was home because of COVID, was this butterfly called the common blue. And all you see when it flies is like a flickering of indigo blue. Um, and then it stops. And then you don't see the flickering indigo blue because it's wings closed and it's kind of gray on the backside. But when it flies, it just does this a burst of beautiful color. Very difficult to see here, but I also had lots of hummingbirds for the first time ever that I've actually noticed. Um, so you can see my feeder there with one um, coming in, but I've seen them at my plants and especially at my tobacco plant this year. I don't have a photo of it, um, but the hummingbirds really love that. Another creature that I see often in my yard is um, this hummingbird moth, otherwise known as a sphinx moth. Um, and it is large and you, when you see it, you're like, is that a hummingbird? It, it has the same body shape and it hovers and flies. Uh, just like a hummingbird. So I've seen this three times in my year. The most scary thing I saw was the thing that you see circled here. I thought it was one of those murder hornets, but it's not. It's a Tremex. Oh gosh, uh, I can't remember the exact name, but it was this huge um, wasp that did nothing. It, but it was. It looked exactly like that, and it scared my scared me. Another fun thing that happened to me this summer in my yard was this lovely cat named Poochie came to visit me in my yard and she liked to jump on my shoulders and just kind of love me up and you know let me love her up so that's Poochie by my composters she liked the composters I think because they were mice maybe coming back and forth there this is my dog Cola her favorite spot on the on the deck is sitting by the tomato plants um, because she loves tomatoes. So her summer spot is kind of right here and she looks at me until I give her a little tomato. Um, there's also tomatillo plants in the foreground. People ask me, do you ever paint plants or do I paint flowers? And I, here's one that probably the only one I've ever done. Um, but this is a, a vase of peonies that I painted for a good friend of mine who let me use her cabin for a week last year. And that is my show. <laughs> I know it's more like a travel tour of what happened in my yard this year, but <laughs> it was a great time to spend in my yard. Um, That's great. Thanks, Wendy. Oh. Um, we do have some questions here. Um, so I will add this one up from Eric. Um, both of your children have songs about bees. How is your family involved and influenced by your bee raising? Uh, also, what's your best bee pun? <laughs> oh, Eric, Eric, Eric. Mm, be, be nice. I have no idea. Be, be good. <laughs> um, how I, I, my, my family um, likes to admire my bees. Um, I, my husband helps me. My husband David helps me. Um, I call him my puff daddy. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to kill me for saying Because he works the smoker, so he's the puff daddy. And um, he helps me with the hive. Uh, my children like to watch, and I don't know, I think they're kind of amazed by by it and amazed at the activity and that, that there's this whole world inside of that hive that they're getting to know and love. Um, so I think that influences their their creative capacity too. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Thanks Eric, Wendy. for that hard question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we are moving on to Bernie. All right. Bye, Wendy. Bye. And welcome, Bernie. Make sure I unmute him there. There we go. Oh, hello, <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome, Bernie. Uh, I'm going to read your bio so everyone can know about you. Um, so. Bernie is a beekeeper and is interdisciplinary artist. Um, so Bernie High is endlessly fascinated by nature and intangible aspects of the human experience. As he pursues his um, MFA in interdisciplinary studies, he currently works with folks at the end of their life to create sincere magical connections that surpass our unique perception of time and space. He finds that there is simply not enough time in the day. Welcome, Bernie. Thanks. And a quick reminder to our viewers, too, as Bernie is giving his presentation, please feel free to add questions in the chat. All right, I'm handing things over to you. All right, thanks for having me. Um, 
I feel like I um, come to botany in a roundabout way. So thanks for inviting me. Uh, in the same way I played baseball when I was young, uh, you can tell by the slumped shoulders uh, just how much of an athlete I was and maybe how terrified I am of the strange man there. I was known for getting lost in the outfield, enjoying the flowers. And when a ball would land near me, I'd jump up in uh, from my daydream and throw the ball somewhere with a lot of gusto. And in that roundabout way, I was playing baseball, but I was really there for the flowers. Um, early art for me centers around photography and experimental independent filmmaking. This piece is a dual projection piece. So two 16 millimeter projectors going at once. Um, it was fascinating actually going through some of this old work and seeing how I use plants and flowers. Um, I started noticing that these old works, um, uh, I use these, these uh, imagery uh, during times of death or transformation. Um, and another early work using this time to dual super uh, eight millimeter projectors and glass and prisms to live manipulate the image. It was a, a, a goodbye to my cat named Kitty Dreams of Dying. And um, it's a little bit of a delicate piece, um, but the smell of flowers is what um, in the narrative caused him to die. Uh, in a theater piece directed by Christine Ells called Kaleidocycle, I brought in, uh, I was brought in as an experimental projectionist and I used branches to um, portray a fracturing of a character's mind. Um, and it's kind of that seemingly chaotic nature of nature of nature that breaks down into fractals um, that are the building blocks around us. Uh, this film uh, shot in a vertical shape of Saskatchewan, um, and it was a project exploring a town that no longer exists, but for that sidewalk and a field that's slowly taking over uh, the sidewalk. Um, in a film called Dolly, where I said goodbye to the idea of ever having a daughter, she fades away at the end only to be lost in the woods as a solemn song is sung about babes in the woods. Uh, and on the right is some uh, detail of some celluloid. Later on, I moved from film into an exploration within visual arts. Here I included plants in my practice, sometimes literally, making explosions of dried leaves spread across various scenes. And in a response to the sudden passing of my sister, I painted uh, this giant, uh, at least for me, leaf underwater uh, stuck against some rocks, growing slimy, uh, growing some slimy algae on it. Um, meanwhile, I'm still a beekeeper and around this time the bees started working their way into my life more. I started getting deeper into honeybees, especially as a source of inspiration and spiritual connection to nature. Uh, so through the eyes of the honeybee, I started looking at plants, especially flowers in a new light. Part of uh, being an urban beekeeper, I found out, is this notion that we are to be uh, doing our activities in the dark for it kind of falls within a gray area of uh, municipal bylaws and my friend and I made a joking uh, joke cover magazine cover um, about covert backyard bees um, and so I thought I'd like to share that as if I could keep the bees um, a secret uh, in any kind of capacity. So here I am with my beehives painting um, some of their flights. There's the magazine, the joke magazine cover it says like what bees? covert inner city apiaries. Uh, it's in, been impossible to lay low with my bees and some of their swarming activities. Thankfully, I have wonderful neighbors who put up with all the shenanigans that come along with having bees. Um, so I spend a lot more time looking at flowers um, and taking pictures of bees on flowers, uh, so many pictures of bees on flowers, because I'm interested in what kind of pollens are getting into and capturing moments like this. Um, which I find mysterious and funny. The beekeeper in a bee suit, I think makes for a great subject in urban photography. Um, they just have like a little bit of a mysteriousness about them. Uh, I spent it, experimented more with uh, visual arts combining with the data of the nectar coming in and I started to look at flight paths and the shadow of trees. Um, so here I am kind of tracing um, some branches and a bee landed on my brush. It made me cry. Um, they kind of do that sometimes when they're really sweet. They're they're really uh, quite sweet. And we have so many different types of bees in the yard now. Uh, here's a bumblebee. Uh, we have really sweet solitary bees as um, my friend just Wendy talked about, uh, like mason and leaf, leaf cutter bees. And I really like the tawny uh, mining bee That's my favorite. Uh, so the air really hums around here. And here are a few photos I took over the few years. Um, 
of creatures who enjoy flowers. There's a bumblebee, honeybee, honeybee, and there's a human bee down in the corner. Um, it's interesting how in my more recent photography, I'm using plants more, um, instead of exploring death, like I was with the black and white celluloid, instead I'm reveling in the symbiotic relationship between flower and bee. So many bees in that lower right-hand corner. That's a swarm that happened this year. My most recent work during my MFA research has been finding ways to take some of these points of data that I've been just discussing and creating a piece of art to tell their story. Observational data like pollen colors, flight paths are being combined with scientific data such as some sensor probes that I've installed in three hives throughout the city measuring temperature, humidity, and just to mix things up a bit in the lower right hand corner is some augmented reality shamanic symbols that I drew from meditative communications I have with my bees. In any case, here's a heat map of the pollination and good vibes that my honeybees spread. The outer ring is the max distance they'll go in Regina, but really they stay within that first red blob. So it's a huge area. If you live in the area of that red blob, uh, my bees have probably drank from your eaves trough. Over the course of the year, I've accumulated quite a lot of data and we're heading into winter and I still have data rolling in, which is kind of unprecedented access to the internal workings of a honeybee hive in Saskatchewan winter. These charts are live um, on my website and made available. Um, and yeah, it's uh, just an enorm enormous amount of data that's that's being um, brought in. And I'm hoping to cr use some of it for some narrative elements in a choose your own adventure uh, story about a particular honeybee. Uh, ending off with this visual art piece, uh, this is acrylic on canvas. It features a lot of the elements discussed coming together. Uh, the right shows a little bit of detail. Um, it's called the chakras of the beehive. So it's my expression of the whole, the soul of the hive mind using pollen and temperatures uh, to determine color, shamanic trippy stuff. And in a roundabout way, um, just like me in baseball, I'm still into flowers. Um, and I just pay a little bit more attention. I think if, moving forward, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay more attention to how I use botanicals in my art. So thanks for letting me join this talk. <laughs> and learn some stuff about, about uh, myself and my art. Thanks so much, Bernie. Um, we do have a question here. Um, I'm gonna let Wendy join in. There we are. Wendy, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, Bernie, you mentioned the solitary tawny mining bee. Why is that your, your favorite solitary bee right now? Like what's so interesting to you about that bee? Um, it's just really beautiful. Uh, it only, it comes out in early spring and it's red and fluffy. Um, uh, yeah, and it, I don't know. You just don't. See, it's rare to see it. So if you, what, if you, yeah. What plants would it? Does it like? Um, well, it uh, digs the hedge. Uh, there's a hedge mm -hmm. here, and um, I have the name of the actual flower on my site, like the scientific name, but I don't have that in my head. It's just a, it's just the traditional hedge you see around Regina. Tony Aster, maybe. <laughs> I'll maybe. look it up. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. There's a hedge that goes around the front, and it's just millions of flowers because they're all super tiny ones, and uh, the bees like that quite a bit. Okay. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. We also have a question here from Christine. Do you see yourself doing more painting in your practice? Um, uh, as a whole, not, not so much recently, but I think I will. Um, definitely after my time um, with some uh, really great instructors at uh, U of R, like Lisa Streifler, um helping me with some visual art stuff which was great so yeah i would totally use it more and uh um but there's some things like this flower we're looking at that i don't think i could ever paint that but um i that the end piece i think is um yeah i think i really dig what i did there and was able to kind of bring a bunch of things together to uh to get what i was looking for mm -hmm. so yeah i would do more things like that sure Great. We have another question here too uh, from Margaret. I love the poetic nature of your films. Do you think that you will return to film as a medium in your work with bees? I guess that's the, the funny thing about interdisciplinary. <laughs> artists, exactly. You're, you're going to do more painting, right? You're going to do more film, right? <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll always do film stuff. And the the thing I'm working on now is is very interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary in terms of like grabbing just very traditional things like visual art and and traditional film and right. having them available um, in that. I, I kind of stumbled over it very quickly, but it's a, hopefully a website where you can kind of navigate through a narrative um, that talks about uh, the life of a honeybee. And um, you basically go from, yeah, the beginning to the end, but uh, through that, you'll experience a few different types of media. Some of them will just be paintings along with words. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be uh, like a 30 second film and you get to choose what uh, what happens next. So. So yeah, in that way, I, I'll be doing both. Great. And I shot, actually, uh, just to add to that, I shot yeah. like hours, maybe days and weeks <laughs> of um, slow motion bees. I found out that my phone does slow motion this summer. It's ridiculous. So hours <laughs> and days of bees. Lots of filming. Um, Melanie has a question as well. So I'm gonna add Melanie into our chat as well here. All um, right, Melanie. So the, the images we're looking at, I, I just tried encaustic painting for the first time just in the last couple of weeks and they kind of had that vibe to me. Have you ever used any wax or materials from your hives in any of your artwork? Um, not, not as, um, I, uh, like, like you just said, but, um, yeah. um, <laughs> I have used it actually in this one right here, I've used, um, straight honeycomb right from the hive, um, dipped in paint and used as a pattern. Okay. Yeah. Um, but no, I haven't done any painting with wax. Cool. And yeah, I haven't, um, yeah, there's been a, a couple things about using wax and using honey. Um, and sometimes I have difficulty with that. I was, uh, I, there was, a, a potential for me to do some some art with uh, someone this summer, but they wanted me to put something in the hive that the bees would build out a bunch of wax on. Mm. And um, I almost did it, but it it just seemed like a waste for the bees. <laughs> so I I don't know I because like they don't they don't care about it. They're not there to build wax on it. Um, and it would use up resources. Um, so when it comes to yeah, using up resources that um, aren't mine, um, I I don't know. I have a I have a difficult. I have I have thoughts about it, <laughs> and so I never get to it. But um, that being said, I did use it here as a pattern. Great. Um, and that looks like all the questions. So I'm gonna join everyone back in here. Just to say a big thank you to everyone tonight for presenting. Thank you so much. Um, and also to our viewers. Um, so for everyone that tuned in tonight and to uh, Wendy, Bernie, Melanie, and Lara, have a great night. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.